Arts is open to the public, I would encourage you to um, go to their website, take a look at uh, the Times uh, to go see that because it's, it's something that uh, is really important now. Also look at their campaign for equal dignity. Again, as I said, we have wanted to do this program with Karen Sherman for some time. She has spent her life advocating for women in war-torn and transitional countries around the world, Bosnia, Nigeria, Rwanda. Uh, and throughout her 30 some year career in global development, she's had the opportunity to meet, to talk with, to interview thousands of women and get from them remarkable stories of not only what they have gone through, but the strength and courage and resilience that they have shown. And that's one of the things that I know is, is important to President Carter. So we're really pleased uh, to have this topic tonight. Karen has served as the president of Rwanda's only women's college. And then prior to that, she was a senior executive at Women for Women International, an organization that helps women survivors of war to rebuild their lives. We're pleased tonight to have with Karen, Atlanta singer-songwriter, Caroline Herring. Now, I wonder why we have a singer-songwriter, because I did. <laughs> when, Frank, when Frank Reese suggested um, having Caroline, she, she writes, but then I, I took a look at it, because she writes and sings songs about injustice and hope and perseverance. In fact, um, Mary Chapin Carpenter, who I, I love as a singer, called Caroline an artist who is fearless and uncompromising in her work, a witness, a historian, a truth teller. Uh, she was the 2001-2002 Best New Artist Award winner at the South by Southwest Austin Music Awards. Since that time, she's recorded eight albums, toured throughout the United States and Europe. But the thing that I find interesting is in 2015, she got uh, Georgia State University's first master's certificate in applied linguistics. And over the past four years, she's taught almost 100 refugee women from 20 different nations, taught them English and taught them civics through Friends of Refugee programs uh, in, in Clarkston, Georgia. So she is the perfect uh, person to uh, to interview Caroline. So ladies, at this point, I'm going to sit back and listen uh, to this conversation. Thank you both for being here. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And uh, no, I'm just a big fan. I know just enough to be um, a tremendous fan of Karen Sherman. Uh, two years ago, my son and I through a Fulbright travel grant, went to Ethiopia uh, for about three weeks where I did teaching and singing and worked in refugee camps on the eastern border near South Sudan. And uh, I am in awe of, of you, Karen, and the work you've done. And so I'd love to start out tonight asking you about how you got into the work of international development and, and working with women. Well, thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here with you. Thank you, Tony, Carolyn, such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. Um, I was very fortunate to kind of uh, ran into the field of international development. I ended up um, moving from Oregon, where I'm from, and uh, driving across the country to Washington, D.C. for an internship, actually, with an organization called A New Coalition for Foreign and Military Policy, which, when I think about it now, sounds like we were trying to overthrow the government, although that was absolutely not the case. And just literally right out of college, had the opportunity to meet General Secretary Gorbachev off at the Geneva summit talks in 1985, um, all of 22 years old and became absolutely fascinated by the former Soviet Union and the transformation that was going on there with Glasnost and Perestroika and ended up getting um, a master's in East European studies and then spending 15 years really working throughout the former Soviet Union, primarily uh, with civil society organizations and women to help them transition to a market economy. And what struck me there uh, so much was that 
when the Soviet Union collapsed, it was really the women who had to pick up the pieces to rebuild their lives, to rebuild their families, to rebuild their economies. And in my career in international development, I've really seen this play out pretty much in every single country context that I've ever worked. Um, in the 10 countries, you know, um, I've worked with across with women survivors of war, um, certainly in South Sudan and Afghanistan, Iraq and Congo, um, and certainly in places like Rwanda. It's women who are really, when, when, the, when everything falls apart, it's the women who are rebuilding their countries, their societies, their families. I think you're on mute. Uh, obviously, you are a, uh, a woman yourself, and that is the, so important to uh, the writing of Brick by Brick because you are combining uh, many worlds. Uh, this, um, these many years of international development with the raising of of three boys, and um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to read this yet, it takes you through the year of of Karen living uh, with her boys uh, and her husband in Rwanda and how she manages that and how she grows and learns and changes. And so I am curious uh, as to how you decided to write such a personal exploration. Your, um, you talk about how your childhood in some ways is a very unique preparation for the work that you did and gave you great insight. Uh, you are pulling from many different areas of insight and, and taking power from that and giving it uh, to the service of the women um, that you meet. And that's, that's what is so extraordinary to me. How did you decide to write this book in the way that you did? Um. Well, as, as Tony mentioned, you know, over the course of my career, I've been so very fortunate to be able to talk with, interview literally thousands of women, um, many of whom have experienced, you know, hardships and restrictions beyond the scope of even our imaginations. And I've listened to their stories. Um, I've sat with their families. I've visited their places of work. And I've learned something about their motivations and challenges and really how they've been able to lift themselves up literally um, a brick at a time. And, you know, as I was um, reflecting on this while we were in Rwanda, I was thinking that, you know, we may feel like, particularly as American women, we have very little in common with these women. And, you know, bringing my experience together from other countries as well, I realized that while our circumstances may differ, you know, country to country, woman to woman, there's actually more there that connects us than divides us. And, uh, you know, bringing my own personal experience into this story um, was really, it was very meaningful to me because, you know, as I've listened to women reveal the most raw and intimate details of their personal lives, it felt very disingenuine to put their stories on the page and not put my own story on the page in an equally open and vulnerable way. Um, because, you know, the fact is all of us in one way or another have had to survive something. Maybe it's discrimination or abuse. Maybe it's inadequate schooling or resources. It may even just be immobilizing feelings of, of fear or self-doubt. And so I think of us all, which is hence the subtitle of the book, you know, survivors in some particular way. And as somebody who has straddled the developing and developed world most of my professional career, I wanted to share some of what I learned with with really other women, but, but more broadly, um, with, with people who might find that this resonates with them in some particular way. And in the midst of, of writing about that so beautifully in the book, you do spend a lot of time talking about these beautiful boys of yours uh, and, and watching them grow you, um, and how they live and the pain of having to leave them to do your work. 
and the joy of, of watching them experience Rwanda and having their minds open so wide. And uh, how, um, how did you decide to, to include this? And it's a large portion of your book. Was it, was it harder to write that aspect of your life? Uh, did that flow more naturally? How did that work for you as you wrote the book? Yeah, I mean, it was a big decision, actually, although if, if you've read the book or um, hearing this, you know, when I moved to Rwanda with my three sons, my twins were 14, my youngest was 11, um, and it was really, um, it, you know, the context is really that I had uh, applied to be the CEO of Women for Women International. I did not get that job and was really you know, the the loss of that, which felt like so much more than a job, was very personally devastating and it brought back a lot of very difficult and painful memories of growing up and, you know, creating disappointment in the family with my father and I just, you know, I was like, I may, I maybe need to go to another place to get myself to a better place. And my husband and I were having problems uh, then and so I literally said, you know, as we were driving to the airport, you know, I think we should move to Rwanda. And by that, I really meant, I think I should move to Rwanda with the three boys. You know, you have to understand the context in that, you know, for most of my career, I've been the parent who left. I left my kids at home with my husband. So this was really important to me to have the boys with me. And I think, you know, I was kind of testing myself. Can I be that kind of parent? Could I be that that single parent? Because I had never really done that before. Um, but of course, um, whenever you make a rash decision like that, you don't necessarily think through the consequences. So I am in Rwanda with the three boys, um, not realizing that I didn't really have the primary caretaker with them anymore. So, you know, a lot of scrambling to take care of the boys and also continue need to do my work traveling to Congo and South Sudan uh, on a regular basis and so by virtue of us all being together the you know the the three boys and myself I really got to know them much more as people and and for those of you who are parents you can really understand kind of that moment where you stop thinking of your kids as kids and start thinking of them as people and we had a lot of that in Rwanda. They got to see my work up close, um, some really very harrowing um, issues that we were dealing with in both Congo and, and South Sudan. And they in turn brought me into their lives in a very personal way. And frankly, it's, it's changed our relationship forever and changed all of us forever. Well, I'm sure it has. And having a 13 year old boy myself who and, and as you said in the book, a, a, a two week trip is uh, not the same as a year. And even, um, and once again, just seeing what, what my son learned and what he experienced, again, uh, leaves me in awe of what you accomplished. Uh, you took your sons, uh, you trained your sons and you hiked to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, would you mind, and we, there's so many things to talk about, but before we move on, could you tell us about that experience and training with your sons and doing that with them? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of a dream of mine, and I think um, you'll appreciate the metaphor, but I really had a, a big mountain to climb, uh, literally and figuratively in terms of that, and so I sort of set out when we were in Rwanda, actually it was, it was, something that I really felt like I had to do and you know I wanted the boys to share that with me I actually wanted my husband to share that with me and so you know while Bill was living in DC at home he was doing his own training I was um, you know we were walking and hiking and with our boots on running regularly with the kids in Kigali which is about 4,000 feet above sea level but still not you know, in comparison to Kilimanjaro. And uh, it was a huge challenge. Um, there were times certainly that I was not sure that we would be able to accomplish that. Um, you know, bringing an 11 year old um, up Kilimanjaro was its own feat. Um, and, 
you know, it, it brought us a lot closer together and going through that challenge. I won't reveal what happened exactly for those of you who haven't read the book yet, but to say that um, it was uh, full of epiphanies uh, on the mountain, um, you know, and everything, you know, above and, and below. Yeah, well, it's remarkable. Um, so you write about yourself, your boys, your husband as going through this experience together. The heroes of your book are the women you write about, uh, particular women. And, and it is true that we've all had difficult experiences, but it's nearly incomprehensible um, for, for most of us to understand what some of the women that you write about went through. And I wonder if you might share, and it's remarkable that they told you the stories that they did. It means they had an incredible amount of trust in you. You were deeply invested in their lives. You did tremendous work and obviously do to this day. Could you tell us about a couple of the women um, you wrote about in the book? Sure. And just to say that, um, you know, story collection was something that I've always done as part of my job. Um, it's part of, you know, when you do international development, um, it's part of the qualitative data collection. And so, you know, you you understand how people are doing based on what you've, uh, the training they've been through, um, the support that you've given them. So, you know, I had notebooks full of stories that I've collected from from women over the years so um, to say the context and of course it's always voluntary for women to be able to share their stories um, that we um, it's really important that women own their stories but for a lot of the women that we worked with at women for women um, sharing their stories uh, felt was it was like breaking the silence uh, for the first time. A lot of these women had never shared their stories before. Um, um, I know this uh, one particular woman in Congo had said, you know, um, she was so traumatized when she first joined our program, she couldn't even say her name out loud. And that's the kind of uh, women that we were dealing with for the most part. And so, just to say there's, you know, Christine in Rwanda who watched as her husband and five children were killed with a machete during the genocide. Um, there is, you know, Deborah and Yvette, all of whom have suffered particular atrocities. But the story I'm going to share with you today is um, one of the most amazing stories from my perspective, and it's the story of Grace who as a 10 year old girl demonstrated one of the most extraordinary acts of moral courage that I've ever seen or heard. Um, Grace, uh, when they started killing during the genocide in Rwanda, Grace uh, was leaving. She was walking to a refugee camp with a lot of other people who were leaving the country. She was with her grandmother um, and they're walking um, towards, towards Congo. She hears screaming by the side of the road and she sees a woman lying there. There's a small baby girl on her shoulder. Um, she sees that the woman is dying. The woman can't speak, but she motions for Grace to come over. Her grandmother says, um, don't go over there. You know, this is going to be dangerous for us. We need to keep walking. Grace goes over and again, she's 10 years old. She takes the baby despite her grandmother's protestations, puts the baby on her back and continues walking with the group of people to Congo. Her grandmother wake, makes her walk behind her so she won't be perceived as a threat or as part of this group that she's in and so they get to Congo she's got the baby on her back the entire way and when they land at this refugee camp in Goma she names the baby Vanessa and so Grace and Vanessa come back into Rwanda Grace uh, raises the baby as her own um, and she never goes back to school and at 13 years old, she tells Vanessa the truth. She says, I was going to be your sister, but I am also your mother. 
And if you can understand that, we can live together for a long time. So when you were spending time with, with women like Grace and Vanessa, when you were uh, spending the year in Rwanda, you were working with Women for Women International. Mm -hmm. And you wrote a lot about the building of a women's opportunity center in South Sudan. Is that correct? Is in Rwanda. In Rwanda. And, um, and so why was that so important to do, Karen? What, what was the work that you were doing to empower women like the ones you just mentioned? You know, um, what I, well, first of all, what I love about the Women's Opportunity Center is was a, it was a hub for learning and commerce for women in the community, um, a chance for women to be able to lift themselves up. And sort of the Women for Women program model is such that women go through a, basically life skills and vocational skills training over the course of a year most of these women, they're all survivors of war. Um, and really, you know, when, when we first meet these women, you know, they're earning maybe mostly nothing, but if they're earning anything, it's like a few pennies a day. Um, and they're completely dependent. They, they have no opportunities. A lot of them lost opportunities for education, for economic participation due to war and conflict and the dislocation resulting from that. And so a place like a women's opportunity center where women can come for to both for learning, for training, to be able to do business there is so meaningful. But what I think is important about the story and also the title of the book is the women's opportunity center was handmade with 500,000 clay bricks, each of them made by a woman survivor. And so to me, the title of the book is really about how women rebuild their lives a brick at a time. Um, and, and really, I've seen this not just in Rwanda, but really everywhere that I've been. And, and frankly, the two things that I have seen throughout all of these um, countries is that education and the ability to earn an income are the two things that make a fundamental difference in the life of a woman and girl. And I've seen that in every single country context. And actually, the two really need to go hand in hand. I, I believe that education alone is insufficient to change that status quo. Because while education gives women voice, it's really the income piece that gives women choice. Before the creation of a place like the Women's Opportunity Center, you were helping women um, in a myriad of ways, including a village gathering and a sharing of financial resources. Can you talk, I, th I find that uh, so fascinating. What, what is that program? What is that process? where the peer lending where women come together and share resources, you know, it's, women are amazingly resourceful. You know, we think we come in sometimes in the developing world and we say, this is how you should do it and this is what should be done. But actually people know what to do. Women know what to do. They need, just need a helping hand. And so uh, what I've seen in, in so many different countries is that women self-organize and they begin to lend to each other. Um, and when those women pay back the money, they pass it on to the next women. And so this idea of cross guaranteeing and supporting each other's loans to be able to help a woman with, you know, hut building, starting up her small business, um, you know, paying for school fees, whatever she needs to do with those money, that money to help her get on to a better life um, is important. And so I've really, this idea of women helping women, women supporting other women, I, I have, um, I, that really resonates with me. And frankly, something that I feel like I've brought back to my work here in the United States too, and certainly with my work with Akila in Rwanda. Well, um, though I loved um, my traveling and my work for that short, short time in Ethiopia, what struck me the most was I was able to go on one day field trip 
with a representative from CARE International in Ethiopia. And I witnessed a group of women in Addis Ababa uh, gathering in um, a small coffee shop. There were 14 or 15 women. They signed their names to the ledger. They put in their amount of money uh, that they each gave per month and they loaned to one another with, uh, I guess, low to no interest and then paid it back and gave that way and stayed that way. And uh, it was really one of the most inspiring moments of my life. And I imagine that's the work that you uh, were doing in all of those countries. Now, um, as you talk about women for women, let's go back to your boys. And I'm wondering uh, how you try to even to help them understand without uh, experiencing, I guess, complete secondhand trauma themselves, yeah. how, how you guided them in understanding the realities of these women's lives. How, Karen, did you, I mean, that was a mighty task you took on yeah. uh, to, to show your boys and to teach your boys about the horrors that these women experienced, that people experienced in Rwanda. Uh, can you give us a little insight into how, into an experience or two or principles you used? Or? Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, particularly for the 14 year old twins, they, uh, Sam and Eli, I wanted them to have some direct experiences. Um, you know, the Women for Women program is built along a sponsorship model. And so you're actually connected up with another woman. And it so happened that um, the woman that I was sponsoring and my husband and I were sponsoring at the time um, was in Rwanda and her name was Yvette. And so one of the things that I did was we went to visit Yvette and, and her three boys. And, um, you know, they had never really had an experience like that. So we went to visit her. Um, her three boys were all, um, they were younger than our boys, but they all appeared to be um, much smaller that they had clearly not been eating enough or getting enough nutrition, which is still a fairly common problem in Rwanda. She took us into her house and showed us where everybody slept. You know, my kids were asking her questions about her life. Um, she said that, you know, her husband had left a couple of years ago. Um, she hadn't seen him. He wasn't supporting them at all. She, um, her, none of her kids were in school because she didn't have money for school fees. She was fairly new to the Women for Women program, and she was just trying to decide what her vocational skill would be, what she wanted to learn. In the meantime, she was, you know, buying and selling tomatoes in the marketplace just to earn a little cash, um, but it, it clearly wasn't enough. And so this just the opportunity to see her life up close, I think, was really meaningful to the boys and there's a line in the book where um, as we're leaving Yvette's home you know Kai was asking me Kai's the youngest the 11 year old and he said you know are we ever going to see Yvette and her boys again and so I and I said Tim well I, but I don't think so but there are women like Yvette everywhere you you just have to look and I think this idea about looking paying attention, paying attention to what's around you, paying attention what that we walk past people all the time that we don't really see and sort of taking that in, that sense of awareness um, and that sense of your own humanity and responsibility as a human. Um, there's another scene where I take uh, Sam and Eli to the Kigali Genocide Memorial and had really debated for months whether I wanted to show them the worst of humanity it's pretty traumatizing and then I felt like I felt like it was the right thing to do to expose them to that and so you know you see them actually taking that in asking questions hearing about the story about what led up to the genocide there's a children's hall uh, that you go through and you see pictures and stories of kids who were killed during the genocide you learn how they died and um, 
it's a lot to take in. It's a lot for anybody. And, um, but I, in the end, I felt like, you know, they needed to know, they needed to see the true cost of otherness, which is exactly what the genocide was all about, otherness, to be able to think and act differently. And that was really important to me for them to see that. Um, and I think, you know, as I've seen them grow and mature, that the twins are just graduated from college. My youngest just graduated from high school. They've carried that with them, um, that sense of their own humanity and their responsibility to the rest of the world, I think, in, in, in the men that they've become. So you took your family for a year to Rwanda. You are now the president of a women's college in Rwanda. You obviously have a great love for this country. What is it that you love so much about Rwanda? What a great question. I'm fascinated by Rwanda. I mean, if you think about where they were in 1994, when nearly a million Tutsi and moderate Hutu were killed over a hundred days of unimaginable violence and inhumanity upwards of 300,000 women were systematically raped and tortured and used and discarded as weapons of war. If you think about that and, and where the country was, and then you think about where the country is today. And if you were to visit Kigali, the capital city, you would be amazed at the transformation and not just infrastructure, I'm not talking about that, but the people, how the government has invested in building a knowledge-based economy, how they've had economic growth at about 7%, how they have the highest percentage of women in parliament anywhere in the world, and women have relatively equal access to education and health care. And I'm not saying there's not problems, and I'm not saying there's not issues, but the resilience, the spirit, um, the humanity of the Rwandan people continue to inspire me. And, and Akila, which started 10 years ago as the first and only women's college in Rwanda, when I think about those young women who come to Akila, who I, I talk about them as kind of the proverbial daughters of the women for women women, the women who sacrifice everything so their girls could have an education. And, and really, you know, 78% of these young women who come to Aquila are the first in their families to go to college. Uh, over 50% of them come from rural areas. And 86% of our graduates uh, find a job within six months of graduation. But here's the most amazing thing. 81% are paying for health care or school fees for other family members. So you're seeing this huge multiplier effect uh, with this uh, education and then the income. And so, you know, when I think about how I spend my time and, and you know, what I want to do in this world, I feel very inspired by Rwanda and, and certainly all the people I've met there. So I believe that soon Tony is going to want to take um, questions from uh, anyone watching. Uh, In fact, Caroline, I, I was negligent um, earlier. I should have uh, reminded folks that at the bottom of your screen, there is a question and answer, a Q&A uh, place where you can write your questions and we'll give those to, to Karen. Uh, but in the meantime, Karen, I'm curious, how do you, you talked about women who had been so traumatized they couldn't even say their name. How do you break through that feeling of helplessness and vulnerability um, and, and turn that into invincibility or a, at least a feeling that they can do something? How do you, how do you break through that? Yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, the, the training methodology is that the training is done in groups of 25. And so the, it's more like it's a combination of group therapy and training. And so, again, for some of these women who've never shared their stories, they've been very isolated. Um, I know for, for those of you who've been to Congo and they know that, you know, Congo is considered the rape capital of the world. Over 2 million women have been raped um, over the country's protracted war. 
these women have been sitting on these stories for such a long time, this deep shame and humiliation. Some of them have been kicked out of their families completely. So we think of it as a, a healing circle for women to come together, to feel safe, uh, to feel respected, to feel heard, to be able to tell their own stories in real time if they want to. Um, and sometimes it's just a kind gesture, um, a loving word from another woman who has experienced something similar. And I think just to be able to do that um, goes a long way to building that feeling of invincibility. And then it's the training and the training is organized around for key outcomes. Um, that women are well, physically and psychologically well, that women are decision makers, that women have rebuilt social networks and safety nets, and that women earn and sustain an income. And so the training is organized around those big life principles, and then they get vocational skills training to be able to practice those skills and to be able to start earning an income. And as they're going through the training program, they're getting a small stipend to be able to maybe bring home a tool or a bunch of bananas to their families to show their value, what they're contributing. And as they become more proficient in this training, you can see this awareness, this awakening, this confidence blooming, something that's been in them all along, but that was recognized. Caroline, do you see the same sort of thing in Clarkston with refugees there? Because a lot of the refugees have been through very difficult times before coming to, uh, to the United States. Well, they all have. I mean, just to, um, to look around a room and know that no one would be there unless they absolutely had to flee their homes or lose their lives. And, um, it, it's very different for us as teachers. Um, it really wasn't our job to ask them to tell their stories. In fact, we really had to curb the, or at least I was taught to curb that curiosity about their lives and their stories because they were dealing with massive trauma that um, we could um, trigger. Uh, and uh, that happened a couple of times in the classroom for me, but in general, uh, social workers and other, other people in their lives who are more trained, maybe much more like Karen, uh, to, to help them in dealing with those, those traumas they experienced. For, for teachers, for ESL teachers and civics teachers, our jobs were simply to educate them uh, culturally in the language and very clearly, you know, to speak uh, and to be able to listen and to be able to write and read and then to be able to become a U.S. citizen if that was their job. Uh, so, um, no, Karen, um, the, the work that she did there now has evolved, right? Now you're the president of a woman's college, the only women's college in Rwanda. And so I'm assuming that you're your views on the education of women in developing nations has evolved as well. What, uh, what made you want to take on this pretty amazing position? How often do you go there? How is the college doing during COVID? Yeah. I mean, I'm uh, obviously a big believer in education, but not just education for education's sake, but particularly one that leads to career outcomes for women, because that's the same the education and income piece going hand in hand. And it's been a really difficult time during COVID. I'll be really honest with you. Um, the government closed down all schools in Rwanda in mid-March. Um, uh, we were like that too. And, you know, we have close to a thousand students on campus. All of them had to go home. Many of them went home to rural areas. They didn't have working e-devices. They didn't have electricity. They didn't have um, internet, of course. And so we, we called every single one of those students. We tried to bring them e-devices if they didn't have them, to get them internet bundles if they needed them, and gave all the students the opportunity to opt into 
virtual learning, essentially. And I have to give tons of credit to our faculty who had not really done online education before. Same story for so many educators around the world. And they made a massive pivot to be able to reach those students, connect with those students, learn on the fly how to make sure that they were um, really getting the kind of education that they needed to get um, during during the, uh, the closure. Our education program is all competency based. And so it's, you know, we measure not just, you know, time in the classroom, but really what the students are able to learn and uh, show that they've learned. And so, um, you know, I'm happy to say that 90% of our students over that period of time did not lose a beat in terms of the education they're receiving. Um, we just, based on a health inspection uh, most recently, just were able to open the campus again um, on October 26th. And so with physical distancing, we have the students back on campus uh, learning again. But um, to your broader point, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of education. And I mean, even in a place like Rwanda, you still see a big cliff when it comes to girls going from primary to secondary about 14 percent of girls go on to secondary school and then it's like a you know a cliff again when in terms of tertiary education which is still in the single digits and you see that play out all across africa um, and it's a it's a huge issue for the continent more broadly if you think about the african continent having a billion young people on the continent by 2050 if we're not able to we're meaning the collective we're are not able to take care of their education employment it's going to be a huge um it's a huge opportunity but it's a huge potential risk and i'm, I'm curious what's the reaction of men to your empowering women do they they feel threatened um it's a great question and um Certainly at, at Women for Women, when I was there, um, it came up a lot. And in fact, women would say, well, it's great that you're training us, but if you're not training, you know, our husbands, our brothers, our uncles, our cousins, you know, we're going back into the exact same dynamic, uh, the same patriarchy, um, the same traditional norms that you haven't really changed anything. And so listening to the women, we went ahead and started a uh, men's leadership program for exactly that reason, so that they were also had access to the training and support that the women themselves were receiving. And we found that that made a huge difference um, in terms of the receptivity of the women. Um, and that in fact, some of the men became some of the strongest allies for the women in terms of their economic empowerment. Now at Aquila, um, you know, we've all had instances where you know fathers didn't think it was worth educating their daughters women having to beg their fathers to allow them to be go on to school um, but i can tell you when those young women get jobs and they're supporting the families and they're you know building a floor on the house electrifying the house paying for their siblings school fees i remember that one of the first times i was there this this uh, father said to me he's like my daughter is worth three sons, you know, it, that was really, it's an amazing thing. But that was that transformation because he saw what a difference it made, not just in her life, but in the life, lives of her family members. Um, and so that has traditionally been the experience with the men. Um, and to also say that, you know, we've had a lot of feedback from some of the young women who've come to Aquila, like, well, what about my brothers? My brothers want to come to Aquila. You know, my, you know, my cousins want to come there. And so in 2019, we launched Davis College, which is a co-ed university to answer the call for those who, uh, those young men who also want, you know, a market relevant uh, education. Um, and we still have Aquila as our women's only college. But you see a whole change of attitude, a whole change of um, self-worth, if you will, on the part of the women and young men. That's right. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and I've heard this from some of our other um, 
uh, you know, graduates too. Dating is a little challenging when you have these very empowered women who come out. <laughs> you know, they're not your average Rwandan woman. And uh, so I think, it, you know, it, it, it is going to ultimately change social norms, uh, not because of what we're doing, but what the women are going to do themselves in terms of changing their societies, which should, which should be how it is. It should come absolutely from those who live there who are from, um, from that society. Yeah. It's sort of the thing that both you and, and Caroline see, providing opportunity can change people's lives. That's right, that's right. Karen, Caroline, I want to thank you all very much. This was just fascinating. It's, you know, I think we all want to do good in the world, but when you can change people's lives for the better, uh, their whole families, that's, uh, that's just a remarkable story. You can get uh, Karen's book, Brick by Brick, at Acapella Books, or there it is. Uh, you can, you can get it at Acapella Books. Uh, you go to their website and uh, help them celebrate their 31st anniversary with that. Uh, Caroline Sherman, Caroline Herring, thank you all very much. Thank you all very much for joining us. And if you've missed any part of this, you can go to either the um, uh, Acapella Books Facebook page and see the recording there or the Carter Library Facebook page and see it there. Thank you all very Thank much, you so much. And we see you next time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.